In our Styracosaurus episode, we spent a considerable amount of time considering the differences between Styracosaurus uh, albertensis and Styracosaurus ovatus, which at the time was separated out into Rubeosaurus, a separate genus. Those have been merged back together. So we're making a video about the difference. <laughs> Historically, we have diagnosed centrosaurine ceratopsids like Styracosaurus based on their frill ornamentation, based on the parietal characters. But some new research has called into question how reliable those bumps and spikes and horns are in, in trying to separate out taxa. This year, 2020, we had three papers in as many months, all concerned with interpreting the frill ornamentation of Styracosaurus and its close relatives. In March, we had a description of a strongly asymmetrical Styracosaurus albertensis skull. In April, we had some researchers reassess a skull assigned to Styracosaurus ovatus as its own genus. Not Rubiosaurus, but Stellosaurus, a new genus. And in May, we had a description of a young adult Styracosaurus cranium. All of these papers agree that Rubiosaurus is Styracosaurus, but they disagree on some of the finer points, and it seems to come down to approaching the problem from different zoom levels. In March, Holmes et al. described a nearly complete Styracosaurus skull, which you can actually view in 3D. It has a right side that is more or less normal for Styracosaurus, though put a pin in that because what normal means is about to change, but the left side was really weird. There was some kind of injury and or infection to the left squamosal bone, which caused the episquamosals to grow in strangely. There's just one big spike uh, towards the front, uh, which seems to have absorbed one or more of the others. And then up at the top, where there would usually be one big uh, epiparietal three, there's two. So how could two sides of the same animal look so different? Aren't we bilaterally symmetrical animals? Well, it comes down to how the epiparietals and episquamosals grow in. These giant horns on the frills of Styracosaurus start off as osteoderms. They're just little things of bone in the skin. And as the animal matures, it attaches to the skull bones. The point on the parietal or squamosal where these little hornlets anchor affects the angle at which the horn grows in as the animal matures. Now, the authors don't explicitly say this, but they imply that the position that it anchors at also affects the size, because their theory is that this extra epiparietal eight grew in and all the other horns shifted up a notch until it got to epiparietal three, which was blocked by that massive epiparietal two. So there were just two crowded ones up at the top. The horns at the back grew in faster and coossified sooner than the horns at the front, which is consistent with how we know these animals grew, which means that the frontmost epiparietals got crowded and became more what's called imbricated. They overlapped each other more so than on the right. Remember that for later, it's going to be important for a different specimen. This isn't the only asymmetrical Styracosaurus we've ever found, but it's way more pronounced than any other specimen has. And apparently the epiparietal three thing is unrelated to the episquamosal thing. Like, what are the odds that an animal that happened to have a, an extra horn grow up top also had an injury to the left side of its squamosal that healed weird? Well, apparently the odds are pretty good because it turns out the type specimen has this too. Also, did you know that the type specimen is only known from the left side? We've just been filling in the right side based on the left? Because now, maybe the left side isn't what the right side looked like. We don't know. This prompted the authors to look at a whole bunch of Styracosaurus specimens, specifically the frills, to see just how much variation we actually have in this uh, genus and species. They found that the little frill epiosifications vary too, particularly epiparietals one and two. In the type, these barely project above the surface, but in other specimens, they're long and curved, about how they are in Centrosaurus, though not as large. Epiparietals six and seven sometimes form as these little rounded D-shaped tabs instead of being short spikes. And this is in contrast to what we see in the closely related Centrosaurus, where 
they have extremely consistent ornamentation on their frills. So Styracosaurus is weird in this respect. So this is kind of cool information for paleo artists and such, because if you're going to depict a herd of individual Styracosaurus, you can have a ton of variations, because just like how humans uh, might have our teeth grow in strangely, Styracosaurus apparently could have their horns grow in strangely. Uh, and as far as I know, there were no orthodontists in the Dinosaur Park formation. But this has the perhaps unfortunate effect that our phylogenetics just got fuzzier. Because if Styracosaurus is this variable, that means that a lot of thrill characters are no longer reliable signals, uh, because they might just be an individual variation. Such is the case with Styracosaurus ovatus, that is, Rubiosaurus. The main distinguishing character for the type specimen of Rubiosaurus is that Epiparietal 3 is inclined more towards the middle than in any other Styracosaurus specimen. It's not the only Styracosaurus to have a medially inclined Epiparietal 3, but it's the most pronounced one. But that means Rubiosaurus now falls within the individual variation that we would expect to see in Styracosaurus, which means it's not justifiable to call it its own genus. You might say, hold on, what about Rubiosaurus's nasal horn and the little brow hornlets above their eyes? Those are slightly different than what's in Styracosaurus. You are correct. Those do not belong to Styracosaurus, but they don't belong to Rubiosaurus either. And to explain that, we need to go to our second paper. In April, Wilson et al. looked at the specimen with those traits, MOR492, and specifically found the parietal squamosal contact and put it back where it belongs. Without that little piece of bone, it seems like the parietal bar is diagonal, and thus the epiparietal 3 inclines medially, like it does in Styracosaurus ovatus. But with that piece of bone back where it belongs, the bar is much straighter front to back, so epiparietal 3 is pointing straight back. And this doesn't have any bearing on the classification, but I think it's neat. They were able to determine that the parietal bar we have is not the right side, as previously thought, it's the left, because those frontmost epiparietals, those ones that imbricate, those ones that overlap one another and turn diagonally as they get crowded, they always imbricate in one direction. So if this bone were the right, those would be backwards, which doesn't seem terribly reasonable. Now these authors don't find that this animal is Styracosaurus albertensis, partially because it's way younger. It's from the upper two medicine formation as opposed to the dinosaur park formation. It's also got those brow horn lengths and the really odd nose horn compared to Styracosaurus. So they erect a new genus, Stellosaurus, because the frill spikes kind of resemble the points of a star. The specific name, Ancillae, is in honor of Kerry Ansel, preparator of this and, and several other important uh, Centrosaurian specimens. These authors also disagree with Holmes et al. as far as whether we should sink Styracosaurus ovatus into Styracosaurus albertensis and just have one genus and species of Styracosaurus. They consider ovatus to still be a valid second species, partially because it is much younger. We don't know the exact provenance, but we know that it's something like 800,000 years later than the other Styracosaurus specimens. More importantly, they think that all of that individual variation that Holmes et al. find in Styracosaurus is actually just change over time. Because they notice that when you zoom out and look at a bunch of different Centrosaurines, those character state changes where you have epiparietals 1 and 6 and 7 being reduced, those become w the norm once you get up towards Aeneosaurus, which I always say wrong, and especially in uh, Pachyrhinosaurus. So where Holmes et al. see individual variation, Wilson et al. see a trend. Now some of you may have thought to yourself, Stephen, what if all of this individual variation is actually not change over time, but change over the animal's lifespan? What if it is ontogenetic? What if the animal's horn arrangement just changes pretty drastically as it ages? We've seen that in other dinosaurs. Well, our third paper in May by Brown and two of the authors from the asymmetrical specimen paper concerns a subadult, or at least a young adult. There's a specimen whose head 
is about 80% of full size of what we would expect for a Styracosaurus. So large as it is, 80% is pretty big. This is the smallest known specimen of Styracosaurus. So even for its age, it was apparently pretty small. We know the animal wasn't done growing uh, in addition to just being small because uh, some of the features on the skull are unrounded or unfused, so they, they hadn't reached their adult shapes. Uh, they're also thinner, so they hadn't laid on all the bone that an adult animal would have. The ornamentation bears this out. The nose horn is small and narrow and curved backwards. The brow horns are small and rounded and the frontmost frill spikes are not sutured to the skull at all. The, the episquamosals are lost because they weren't attached to the bone and they, after the animal died they just washed away or something. The rear frill spikes are longer than we presume the episquamosals to have been, but they're still short compared to other specimens of Ceracosaurus. But the texture of the bone doesn't have the mottled quality that a juvenile would have, and the bone doesn't have this long grain texture either. So the, the animal had finished its juvenile stage despite still having juvenile horns, which means unlike other specimens of Styracosaurus we found that look like this, this animal was an adult. It was just on the cusp of growing its adult ornamentation when it died. The authors don't speculate about what this would mean for its biology, but it's kind of interesting because it means that Styracosaurus could reach, you know, 80, almost 90 percent of its full size without growing in its distinctive full long frill spikes and still having its uh, uh, little kid nose horn, which would imply to me that the frill spikes and nose horn were way more important uh, for sexual selection or for competing for mates rather than specifically for defending against predators because the animal is at its most vulnerable to predators when it's young, statistically. And apparently the, the little tiny frill spikes that it had were enough to deter predators if that was their purpose. Whereas once it reaches sexual maturity, then suddenly it grows the big, long, distinctive uh, epiparietals that we know and love in Styracosaurus. So they're for sexual selection, tentatively. Brown et al. also took a more quantitative look at the epiparietals, and they specifically wanted to see whether the angle that they're at varied across the animal's life, so whether there was ontogenetic variation. Now, if the animal's epiparietals varied across its ontogeny, we would expect that horns anchored at similar positions on the frill would vary in angle between different animals, especially if those animals are of different ages. Instead, though the epiparietals do vary a lot, Horns that are anchored at similar positions on the frill are remarkably consistent as far as the angle that they grow in, even across animals that are at different stages of life. They also pointed out that contrary to Wilson et al's idea, there isn't a clear trend over time within Styracosaurus specimens uh, regarding the epiparietals 1, 2, 6, and 7. Like what we might expect to see would be the lowest occurring Styracosaurus have really big epiparietals 1 and 2, really big epiparietals 6 and 7, and then the higher you go, the smaller they get. That is not borne out. Some really low Styracosaurus, really early Styracosaurus, have small ones, and some really high ones have big ones. I'm not sure if this exactly contests what Wilson at all were talking about, because they were more concerned with, okay, whatever variation existed in Styracosaurus goes away once you get to whatever the next animal is, which in their case was Stellosaurus. But it is just emphasizing how weird Styracosaurus is, that it ha it was like this experimental phase that Centrosaurines went through, and then it was all done with it and everybody got on the same page again once Stellosaurus appears. Remember our asymmetrical skull from earlier and how the working theory was that an extra epiparietal grew in, like uh, epiparietal 8? grew in all the way at the front and pushed all the other horns back. I feel like Brown et al's look at the angles that horns grow in at calls that working theory into question. Correct me if I'm wrong, but looking at this graph, it would seem that on this specimen, it makes so much less sense 
to have an extra P8 shove all of these up than to just have an extra P3. Because based on the author's numbering, which implies a left-right homology between these different horns, I thought they were saying that all the left epiparietals moved up one position. But we know that the rearmost spikes grew in first and fastest and that they crowd out the front, forcing them to tilt and overlap, which is exactly what happened in this specimen. So a simpler explanation, in my opinion, is that an extra epiparietal three just happened to exist, like how goats will sometimes grow an extra horn, or cows will grow an extra horn, and two spikes anchored at the epiparietal three locus and grew in like epiparietal three and just shoved the next couple of spikes out of the way a little bit. Like, that seems like a simpler explanation looking at how the horns so perfectly line up to where you would expect, you know, P5 and P6 to be. So maybe I'm reading too much into their numbering system because maybe they aren't supposed to be homologous. Maybe it's just, you know, this is the first one, therefore it's P1. This is the second one, therefore it's P2, regardless of how it originated. But it bugged me, and now it might bug you. So you're welcome. So, Styracosaurus is weird. Kinda already knew that. It's a weird dinosaur, and that's why it's popular. But it is interesting to note that even amongst its compatriots, you know, the, the Centrosaurian ceratopsids are all pretty strange looking animals. Styracosaurus is even an outlier there, where it's this, it's not a phase mom era of experimentation amongst our North American ceratopsids. But I am really excited to see what research gives us next. So I... Hope to see you next time. Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong, and remember to like, comment, and subscribe. We would like to extend a special thank you to these individuals who have gone above and beyond to support this show. We could not have done it without you. Thank you.